Um, I'm the chair of this panel, and I have to make sure that we finish on time in at uh, 1.5. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I think this panel is uh, about language and culture, cultural discourse. And uh, basically, what I understood when I read the abstracts of the participants, um, that most of the presenters here are going to work with corpora and uh, some some of the budgetary. Um, so I guess that there's much said about corpus and the uh, relationship between corpus, language, and, and culture. Um, yeah. I normally, my name is Ron Scholz. I, I'm working at the, the University of Warwick. And um, I just need to now to switch to my presentation. And I um, normally didn't work about culture. Culture is really something that is quite strange. And uh, I, I normally work with corpora, corpus linguistics, and I try to apply corpus linguistics for discourse studies. I analyzed political discourse. I collected large amounts of um, texts on, uh, on elections or on crisis or on the Bonn process where we created the corpus to uh, press corpus and analyzed how um, political actors and political content are presented in, in, in this corpora. And I never asked myself, uh, what is culture actually? And so, before this, this conference, I was a bit struggling. And this, this, <laughs> this presentation is about this kind of struggle and how to analyze culture with corpus linguistic, linguistic methods. And I'm basically Ask what is culture? How can we understand culture? How does it can it be linked to discourse and the discourse studies? And uh, what is lexical commitment? This is the approach that I'm using. And I'm just going to go quickly on my research project um, presenting the corpus and some findings. Yeah. So what is culture? There, I think I found two, yeah, maybe two distinct approaches in. In the literature, one that I would say is more cultural, uh, positivist approach. Culture is something that is predetermined and an objective set of values and beliefs. Um, culture is something that you are, as it's uh, described to you, um, and is basically based on, on these uh, large scales or surveys. Um, and the result is something like these uh, generalizations. The Germans are like this, and the uh, Japanese are reserved. Germans are punctual, and stuff like this. And it's a bit. It's, it's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's true, but not always. That's the problem, I think. Um, then there's the cultural constructivist uh, side, and here culture is something more complex. It's uh, socially constructed set of behaviors, practices. Um, culture is something that you do. It's a, it's a practice, as you say. And so there are these deconstructive or constructive, reconstructive uh, approaches that use rather uh, qualitative methods to describe the heterogeneous practices that result in a certain, uh, in a certain culture. Um, there's this concept of perform performative uh, culture that I came across uh, of a German uh, sociologist, and uh, I'm not going to read this who takes too much time, but uh, basically what he's saying is that um, culture is a set of, yeah, we have to understand language and use. Um, oh, it's yeah, it's real. Then we have a uh, background knowledge of a uh, language community, and or these two together, these three together, end up in a, in a cultural life form. So language practices and the understanding um, between language users, how language functions, uh, creates this cultural life form. So what, what is discourse then? Um, yes, many of you might know this, this quote. For courses, um, 
these uh, discourse as, as the practices which systematically form the objects of which they speak. Um, so we could say discourse is um, the social production of meaning in a certain context. So discourse researchers may, uh, mainly deal with language and use, knowledge, and the questions of identity and subjectivity. Um, how can we put culture and discourse together? So I, I think uh, language and use, we, as discourse researcher, we would look at language practices. Um, then we would rather talk of discourse communities than of language communities. And uh, the cultural life form could maybe understood, be understood as the hegemony, a hegemony concept of uh, Lacla Ruf, post-structuralist uh, theory. Hegemony is the way how people talk about a certain, it's a certain way of articulating events that um, repeat, are repeated in a certain discourse. Maybe you can say it like this. Uh, and therefore, they, 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 they um, so a certain language practice that is predominant in a certain discourse, that, that would be a hegemony, very roughly said. Um, but discourse researchers also deal, of course, with questions of power, social practices, that is more the context of, of, of discourse, social systems, institutional uh, structure, and uh, as I already said, subjectivity. Um, is it a useful combination, culture and discourse? Uh, we, um, if we have a, the cultural life form, cultural life form uh, implies that there's something like cultural context. And um, if we say that there's a set of background knowledge, then um, we, the, the concept of culture allows us to distinguish or to mark some cultural boundaries. What are these cultural boundaries? I think mainly there are institutional and linguistic um, boundaries, institutional boundaries, like a political party could be an institution that has a certain, certain culture. Um, and linguistic, of course, every country has a, 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 has a, a national language that creates a certain a discourse of boundary, but also in a political party, you have a certain language that creates, and this is a, a linguistic boundary in a way, that creates um, a cultural, that is marked by the, by the cultural context. So, um, yeah, the concept of um, culture allows us to explain something that is uh, unexplainable. Why does X say, Y using this particular form, content, or style as part of this, his or her discourse practice. So, I mean, it, 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 we can use culture as an explanation why there are different differences between certain political parties or certain countries and, and so on. Um, why using corpora? Uh, yeah, if we want to look at discourse, Causes as social production of meaning. Um, corpora allow us to collect large amounts of text and language practices. And um, we can analyze these practices. In Germany, um, there is the discourse linguistics, uh, uh, li linguistic approach uh, developed. Uh, in this approach, in this course, is understood as the virtual corpus of all texts concerning the same topic, which was formulated by Busse and Teubert um, a couple of years ago. And in, um, in practice, we would create a concrete text corpus that represents this virtual text corpus that is analyzable. Because the virtual corpus is something that is actually so big that you can't really account for it. Um, um, yeah, that's statistical measurements. What, what, what are they? What, what can we do with it? Because, yeah, if you create a corpus, you want to analyze it, and if you have lots of text, normally you would start with statistics. Or not, but I do. Um, 
So these statistics allow to compare, classify, and analyze the lexicon of a corpus in a zirconic uh, perspective or in a diachronic perspective. It's uh, very useful when you want to uh, analyze the development of, of the discourse. You can look at over under representation of certain words, uh, which is called the specificity of the keywords, the keywords of certain words, and um, on collocations, what is the context these terms are used in. And by using these measurements, you, come, you can highlight certain language use patterns, as we call them, certain um, language practices practices that reoccur very often and we would say okay because they, they occur very often that is something important for the discourse for the, maybe for this, this uh, for the discourse of culture for this discourse community um, and I would say these are the, the macro structures of the discourse they are um, the, the actors we, we have the actors that reappear in the discourse and in the corpus we have certain topics that are important that reappear, and we have certain arguments that are linked to the topics and the actors, and this is what I would say is the macro structure of this course. Um, and with this macro structure, we can uh, make assumptions about the structure of the social reality of a certain society or, or a part of society, and um, maybe uh, uh, cultural life forms. Um, so, the, the hypothesis for this, this talk is cultural is constituted by common background knowledge of the language community, analyzing language practices performed in different cultural contexts allowed to access the construction of performative culture and cultural contexts influenced by institutional um, and linguistic structure. Um, how can we analyze political culture with corpus linguistic tools? How do different contexts influence the language practices? Answers is by looking at similarities and differences in language practices within different cultural contexts. And um, yeah, cultural context can analyze by comparing language practices in different linguistics, different linguistic contexts. Uh, national languages or language varieties, um, registers, this is um, yeah, the kind of text type uh, that takes into account the social uh, context. Um, we can also look rather on institutional context, political culture in a certain political context or uh, statistics. Uh, we could say, okay, because um, in English uh, manifestos, in English uh, election manifestos are more proper names uh, compared to German manifestos that say something about the discourse of culture in, uh, in the English political world is an assumption. Um, we could uh, also ask ourselves about why um, in the German left party uh, in action manifestos, the word und and is the most frequent one when actually in other and all other big corporal uh, D is the most uh, is the most frequent one. And does this have any anything to do with, with the culture? Um, and um, you could look at political culture in certain linguistics, the linguistic context concerning a certain topic. Um, we, that means we, we choose a certain topic and look how, um, how this uh, topic is treated by different political parties. So, for instance, what I uh, look for this talk at is the opposition between Europe and national states, and I would use more qualitative uh, tools to do this. So, there are different methods in the uh, lexical matrix. Yeah, of course, uh, frequency analysis. Then correspondence analyzes specific specificity or keyness of vocabulary, collocation, confidence. And I'm just going to use frequency today and some collocational analysis and some text sections. How much time do we have? Five. We started late. I think we should give it more. Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, the research corpus, I created the corpus of election manifestos for uh, the text for elections between 79 and 2014. Um, an election a manifesto of the National Political Party, because there are the European uh, parties, but I used the National Political Party manifestos. Um, the, 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 the condition was that um, the political party at least was once elected to the European Parliament in this period. Um, uh, political parties included in the German corpus is of course only parties in the national parliament, but since last week we had a, a, a change of laws in Germany, all the little small parties are not now, yeah, they have better chances to get in because we don't have the 5% threshold anymore. So we have all this, uh, this more conservative right-wing party, family party, and, and some others, um, pirates, right-wing, right-wing extremists actually, that got into, into the European Parliament uh, in 2014. Um, in the French corpus, we have other right-wing and uh, conservative parties. The, um, more central parties or liberal parties, uh, the, the Green Party, and uh, all the range of uh, different left parties in red. And um, British, it's a bit more, it's easier. Yeah, we have the BNP and the UKIP as more right wing, uh, Conservatives, LDP, Greens, Light uh, Kumrai is the Welsh National Party, SNP, Scottish National Party. Labour Party and the SDLP is the Northern Ireland uh, Social Democrats. Um, yeah, that is one of one, one of mm. one of the first yeah easy. Unlike this, is just frequency based, so I used the software that is able to distinguish between grammatical words and uh, semantic or more semantic semantical words, as we could say. Um, and what appears is the most frequent words, uh, this is semantical words, Europe, Europe, EU, Britain, the British corpus of course, which is quite interesting um, because if you look at the French corpus, we have a kind of similar structure, same words, and also the relation to, to France. I should actually now present a player, I have also the German part, uh, uh, same kind of words. Um, Deutschland, and then what we also see is that the, the software I'm working with um, does not work properly for the German language because it includes some grammatical words that should be. The English is very Yeah, yeah, it's 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 very yeah, yeah it's, and it's, you could, of course, uh, look at this more and more. Yeah, but, but, um, and, and I'm not sure, maybe it would appear also in the, in the French and the British parts, but as I say, the, the software dictionary for the German uh, language doesn't work properly, so that's why you see it here, actually, and the only that should be excluded. And then, indeed, it is interesting to see also Muslims, something like, you must do it, or somebody has to do something, which is, is quite interesting. Um, yeah, um, so this, just to get an idea about the most important concepts in, in, the, in the corpus, and well, because I saw that Europe, yeah, it's going to be uh, quite straightforward, is uh, in all three corpora, I had a look what uh, is what are the collocates, what are the words that occur very often with, uh, with Europe in all three corpora, and what we see, maybe let's stick with the British, the British corpus, we see that Europe, of course, uh, is in these uh, sentences very often, but we have also a strong nations united together, prosperity, and all these uh, democratic citizens, peace, world, future, future freedom, uh, social. So the red marked uh, concepts appear also in, in the other two corporate as collocates of Europe. Um, we have in, in German peace, freedom, world, um, citizens, democracy, future, and the same in the French uh, corps, democracy, liberty, citizens, uh, world, um, and, and, and so on. 
Um, and then we have some similarities between the German and the, the French, uh, the, the British corpus, which is common together, prosperity, and some that are rather similar to um, in, in, the, in the French and the, the British corpus. Interestingly, they talk more about uh, nations, uh, maybe United Nations, we don't know at this point, but they analyze it. And in, in France and Germany, we would talk more about solidarity, which I can't see here, but it should be somewhere. Maybe it's. Um, so, this is also to, to get an idea. Um, and what, what, if we uh, summarize this, we see that. Um, yeah, there are these uh, values that seem to be important in conceptualizing Europe as peace, freedom, um, future solidarity. And they occur in all three, three corpora. And then we have more of these uh, nation driven uh, values like prosperity, strength, security, justice, and stability. And they are not that strong in the British corpus. So Britain, Europe is not maybe not so nation. They're not so constructed by nations of the parties. Um, I go around the, oh, this one. Yeah, if you look now at more uh, qualitative methods, um, I had a look at how Europe and Germany um, are uh, put in opposition in uh, different parts. You, have, you can have this diachronic approach like by looking at uh, uh, the same party, this is, by the way, Christian uh, socialist, uh, Christian social democratic union. Um, in '79, they talk rather, yeah, and they are Bavarians, of course, and they are were quite successful in the last 50 years, um, and they create. In 79, they talk of, of Europe more as um, Bavaria and the CSU have, have power of all over Europe. So there's the influence of the Bavarians on, on Europe. It's not the other way around. That's what I was interested in how this opposition is um, actually uh, created. So it seems in this uh, quotation that the Bavarians have influence on Europe and not Europe doesn't have that it seems to have an influence on, 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 on Bavaria. Um, and in 2014, that changed that slightly. Europe is more created as a geographic and uh, economic entity. Germany is something powerful, and um, because it talks about the economic growth um, of of uh, Germany, um, and it implies that economic growth is something good. And it shows also that politics became more interested in the economy and. and uh, the mainstream talk uh, about politics is, is, is much more about um, um, economy than it might use it might have been before. So what I did then, I don't know how much time is there? Oh. Well, okay. What I did then uh, to access um, culture, I just looked at more of these examples uh, from uh, just from 2014 to, to understand. Um, to understand uh, how this opposition was created in the same year. Um, if we look at 2014 in the German corpus, Germany influences Europe. Uh, there's something like uh, powerful Ger Germany, uh, the FDP, the Liberal Party, um, talks more about Germany and Europe. So this is quite, uh, quite, uh, um, Salient in the German corpus, we have always, always Germany and Europe. Um, and Germany and Europe, and it, it creates the, the impression that Germany is integrated in Europe, there's no opposition. Um, the Greens say that Europe is actually kind of the same thing. Europe is not, has, seems not to have a political influence uh, integrated in Europe. Um, the right of political strike must be granted in whole Europe. Um, 
So it's also more a geographical entity. Europe is more geographical entity. It doesn't seem to see. It seems not to have political power. Um, and then the SPD is similar. So we have this kind of more integrated concept of Europe in in, um, in German text. And if you look at the, the French, yeah, this is slight, slightly different uh, picture. Um, France is a big country, the motor, and yeah, it's, it's similar to, to the first quote in the German corpus. So the conservative party in Germany says something similar. So this is this powerful France. Then the right wing party um, puts France in opposition to, to to Europe. So that seems to be they seem to be not at all uh, integrated at all. Uh, do we want more Europe and less France, or more France and less Europe? Is the question. Um, so Europe is a danger for France in this code. And if you look at this left wing party, it is a bit similar. Even breaking up of Europe of Brussels, the capitalist France would stay subjugated to the financial market and so on. So um, Europe is a reality, and France is kind of in the trap of globalized capitalism. Europe doesn't help us with this with the globalized uh, capitalism. Um, the socialists. Um, Uh, the socialists will not be able to accept the ratification of the treaty that has uh, an impact on economic interests as well as on the social model of France and of Europe. So here we have a, actually an opposition of France is integrated in Europe, and um, the PS is a powerful party that is able to to protect uh, France from this global globalization. And maybe the last one is. And uh, quite interesting, actually, um, Europe here, by drawing from this new Europe, France will be able to continue to play an important role in the world. This is very typical for the goalist, the, the, the conservative parties in France. Uh, the goal actually uh, kind of wanted the European uh, uh, community because it gave, he, he hoped that it would give France the opportunity to, to get, get more um, importance in, in the world. So we have, we see here that actually this party uh, keeps to this tradition and to this culture. So Europe has an uh, empowerment of France, a power, powerful France. Um, yeah, we, we skip the British corpus, which is a pity actually, because it's quite interesting. In the British corpus, what we would see is that actually. Uh, UK is always constructed as something sovereign. Sovereignty is something important, and uh, they seem to be outside uh, outside the, uh, the European Union in, in some way. So that is another strategy to deal with, with, with Europe as a, um, as a political entity. Um, yeah, finally, from the world powers and all three uh, language cover, we have uh, we had uh, a similar social values. Uh, does this refer to, to similar language practices? Uh, we can, we, I think we, have, we would have to, to go in more deep uh, analysis, and deeper analysis, cultural proximity. It could be uh, um, an indicator for cultural proximity, proximity and um, also for the certain social practices that are uh, imminent for these political parties. Uh, from these text sections, we saw that um, there are differences in language practices representing Europe, depending on the political culture of every country, but also of the political orientation. Um, in uh, Germany, we had this, you can see that there's power on Europe, but uh, uh, it is an uh, uh, Germany seems to be an integrated nation. There seems to be no power struggle. Uh, whereas in France we have um, this is power in Europe, but sometimes uh, the right-wing parties uh, seem to um, refer to Europe as something dangerous. Um, and in Britain, as I already said, so uh, it's more of an emphasis on sovereignty. So all German parties uh, seem to refer to an integrated nation-state. And um, the liberal green parties in France and the UK 
uh, seem to, to have the same uh, language practices. So there, there might be cultural proximity between between these kind of parties, the liberal and green parties. Um, Europe as danger might be um, part of the language practices are uh, language practice of extreme parties, left and right wing. And um, Europe of empowerment and strength in the old nation is rather something that uh, is uh, used in conservative uh, parties in France and in the UK. So that's basically what I present. Um, should we have a short discussion or? Yeah. No? <laughs> sure. Maybe one, two questions. Uh, okay, I would like to ask you about language itself. If you included it uh, in the cultural values that uh, yes. you research, that language itself in the non English speaking countries, for instance, was the national language an asset? Was it a value in itself preserving the national culture, the national culture and the national languages? In the European context, uh, in terms of culture, because you had yeah. at the beginning sets of values. Yeah. How they perceive Europe, but in yeah. the, in the terms of uh, uh, language in itself, not language practices about yeah. Europe and yeah. our. Um, and I. Are you asking about uh, language policies or like uh, yes. if they refer to language policies? Yeah, and uh, no, they, they don't. There is no, I think there are some parts in, in some election manifestos, and the election manifestos get longer and longer over the last couple of years, where they now take into account these questions. But uh, normally, in the beginning and throughout yes. the 90s, they would just refer actually to national. Uh, politics. So that's why it's actually interesting because the, the European uh, Parliament election for a long time in the European Union was not something that was perceived as, as uh, political or this election, the Parliament didn't have much power. So uh, the, the, the political scientists talk also of uh, secondary elections because they were not important. It was just test elections for national parties. So they would come up with manifestos uh, uh, concerning uh, national issues and not European issues. Yes. Um, but that changed a little bit now in the last couple of years. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, maybe it's not, I, I didn't create the right uh, corpus for this question, I would rather say. Yeah? Uh, if you want to look at uh, language policies, you would create a different corpus, maybe. I don't know. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. This is what okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, just two uh, short comments. Uh, what I found interesting is that, well, you have in German Gemeinsamkeit, which I think is what had to be expected. I mean, they were saying what the kind of, uh, well, uh, uh, some com commonalities all over Europe. So, But uh, you also have it in, in the English corpus, which I found quite uh, surprising. Uh, together, I think, for the world. Yeah. And I would be interested. I mean, that would be something to find out. Who actually is included in this together? Yeah. Uh, is yeah. it just the different British nations, the Welsh and the Scots and the, and the English, or is it really England being together or Britain being together with other nations? And I can't imagine the second one. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's so true. that would be something to, to really yeah. have a look at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, as to uh, uh, as to what you've said about uh, the, uh, language and culture, uh, uh, well, uh, maybe coming from a different perspective, I think what uh, makes something to be actually a phenomenon of culture, not a phenomenon of nature, but, yeah, uh, is that uh, whatever is a cultural phenomenon is something that has to be taught by mm -hmm. using some kind of language. And this is the reason why chimpanzees, for instance, don't develop a culture that they can't be taught because there's no language available to them. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, if you want, uh, if you bring up people, well, saying, well, this is how we do it, uh, 
about you always have to use language. So I think that the element of teaching is what distinguishes humans from other animals like chimpanzees, who also can learn, of course, by, uh, by uh, trial and error and by imitating uh, their, their carers, but uh, they can't be taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, I think this is an interesting comment. Maybe this is the dimension that this is lacking uh, in the course of the has to be taught. Uh, I think that's something uh, that you find this being addressed in books on, on uh, well, uh, uh, evolutionary anthropology sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, but, but, uh, or, or where they talk about, uh, yes, about uh, apes and what apes can do, Tomasello and, and, and people like that. Yeah, thank you very much for your question.